What is a theory? My professor asked me in my last oral exam at university. Ha! What an outrageous thing to ask. I had apparently answered the questions related to the course material so well that he now wanted to test me. The annoying thing was, I couldn't really answer the question well. When are you ever asked what a theory is? This video will help make sure that you don't experience the same thing that happened to me. From now on, you will always have an answer for the question, what is a theory, plus some knowledge about the philosophy of science at your fingertips. And now, without further ado, welcome to Schreibe. Many thanks to Scribba for sponsoring this video. More about Scribba later. Defining the term theory is not so easy, but one thing is clear. Anyone who wants to deal with theory from a philosophy of science perspective cannot ignore one man, Karl Popper. Popper defined theory as universal statements used to cast a net to catch the world. So a theory should aim to contribute general statements about phenomena in order to better explain or understand them. Specific statements that are only true in a particular situation are therefore not suitable as theory. A theory often only considers a specific section of reality. This section can then be represented as a so-called model. But why was Popper's work so important? Until his book The Logic of Scientific Discovery was published, it was not really defined when a methodology was considered scientific and when it was not. This is also called the demarcation problem, that is, the dividing line between science and non-science. At that time, Popper criticized in particular the backward-looking character of many studies. For example, Popper's contemporary Sigmund Freud looked back in time to explain the present. What Popper disliked was the fact that Freud could always search for evidence that confirmed his theory instead of looking for evidence that refuted it. Albert Einstein, on the other hand, tried to make predictions about the future using theory, which Popper preferred. However, theory according to Einstein's approach is much more fragile, as only one event in the future is enough to bring down the entire theory. But Popper was convinced. He believed that theory must be falsifiable. The old view was this. If I find a handful of white swans, I can propose the theory that all swans are white. Popper's view, however, was this. If I find a single black swan, I can refute the theory that all swans are white. Instead of looking for evidence, we should look for counter-evidence. The development of a theory most often involves the observation of real-world phenomena. At least when we conduct science based on the idea of empiricism, which presupposes that knowledge is generated through human experience. By means of interpretation and abstraction, we can convert the observed phenomena into theoretical concepts. On a practical level, we can do this during the qualitative analysis of interview data, to name just one example. At this level, we can also make assumptions about how these concepts are causally related to each other. This is a very important component of any theory. What is the relationship between the individual concepts? Once concepts and their relationships are established, we can in principle speak of a theory. Now it is a matter of repeatedly testing, expanding or falsifying it. To do this, concepts are transformed into constructs that consist of individual variables. This step is important so that we can determine what to observe and measure in a study. Measurability is achieved by operationalizing variables. The theoretical relationship between the variables is expressed in hypotheses that can be tested through statistical calculations. Here we are in the realm of quantitative research. For example, an experiment could be carried out to draw conclusions about the relationship between two or more variables. To bring some more order into all these components of theory, you can ask questions such as Wetten did. First, what? Which factors, be they concepts, constructs or variables, should be considered at all? Here the principle of parsimony or Occam's razor applies, namely, 
The theory that requires the fewest components to explain the phenomenon is usually the best. How? How are the factors connected to each other? You can easily imagine this with the boxes and arrows that are usually used as a graphic element to illustrate a theory in 2D. Why? What are the dynamics that the theory tries to model? What are the causal relationships that the theory assumes? Who, where, when? What are the limitations of the theory and who or what can it not represent? Before we now continue with an alternative understanding of theory, let me just say a few words about the sponsor of this video, Scribber. If you are looking for a proofreading service or plagiarism check for your scientific work, I can wholeheartedly recommend the team at Scribber. Just have a look at scribber.com and send me a short email to info at schreib.eu for an exclusive coupon code. Popper's idea of what a theory is, is not the only understanding. Although Karl Popper did not consider himself a positivist, the understanding of theory that we just explained corresponds to positivist assumptions. This would mean that we humans can perceive the world as it is with our senses and can therefore make statements about the objective world. In the natural sciences, these assumptions are not questions so much because, to put it bluntly, the probability that we live in a matrix and that the laws of nature do not reflect the objective world is rather low. If scientists were to question the assumption that there is some sort of objective world outside of our minds, it would be very hard to conduct natural science research at all. But in the social sciences, this epistemological standpoint has often been criticized. The reason for this is that the research objective here is different, for example, human behavior. Over time, however, sociology, psychology, and now even communication or media studies have increasingly been overlaid with natural scientific principles. An example of the resulting conflict was the so-called positivism dispute, in which the German Frankfurt School, led by Theodor Adorno, took a counterposition with their critical theory. According to critical theory, the subjective character of knowledge acquisition must also be taken into account when developing theory. All right, we've clarified the question, what is a theory? Hopefully. To wrap things up, here are a few thoughts on why theory is important. After all, couldn't we simply observe the world and write down our findings without abstracting them into theories? Well, we might miss out on a lot of potential if we were to discard theory. First, theories help us better understand the world. I always think of theories as glasses. I can put on different glasses and see the world in another way. Through one pair, I see certain aspects of the world more clearly and through another pair, I get a completely new perspective. Two, theories collect our knowledge. Here you can imagine a theory to be like a Wikipedia article. Someone writes the first draft, which is then checked, developed further or even criticized by others. The important thing is always that every scientific work somehow tries to make a contribution, sometimes smaller, sometimes larger. Three, theories help in practice. Through theories we can uncover problems and derive actions to change the world for the better. And that is a wonderful idea, isn't it?